Hey everybody, good morning. Here we are. You know, we're almost in the season of gifts now, aren't we? Isn't that amazing as we're rolling up ahead? You know, Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon.com, he's just rubbing his hands thinking about Black Friday, isn't he? He's like, yes, here we are again, I'm back. All the money he's gonna make. It's hard to talk about gifts. We're here to talk about gifts, and it's hard to talk about gifts without thinking about gifts in our cultural framework. We bring those ideas to the text when we read about gifts in the Bible. We can't help but do that. Uh, maybe you're thinking about what you're gonna get someone you love for Christmas. Maybe your mind already is turning to that idea. Maybe there's someone out there who's trying to figure you out, trying to figure out what they're gonna get you for Christmas. Uh, maybe you're a really picky person or you're you're a person that's hard to buy stuff for. Some of us are like that. Uh, they're scratching their head. Maybe uh, uh, we, we like to get people gifts that will not only surprise them, but also make them really happy, don't we? That's kind of the goal of the season. There, there are gifts that people like, and there are gifts that people need. And there are gifts that have a message built into the gift. Like when someone gives you a package of uh, training sessions with a personal trainer, right? If your spouse does that and they buy you a package of training sessions with a personal trainer, aren't they saying something to you with that? <laughs> they are saying something. Uh, Debbie told me she's getting me hiking boots for our trip to Sedona. She says, you don't have shoes for hiking? I said, no. If I did, I wouldn't have an excuse not to go hiking more. So she got me uh, boots. Well, um, God has a gift for you. It's a gift with a message built into it. Uh, just like that. That's really what we're here to talk about today. He made you to be active. He has a gift for you that's an active gift with a message built into it. And that's uh, what we're going to look at today. Uh, the world wants to keep you sitting down, comfy, in front of a big screen with product information and advertisements coming out in front of you. If they can just park you there, all of their dreams come through true. But God has a gift for you. And it's an active gift. And it has a message built in. With that gift, there is a purpose. It's his purpose for your life in that gift. Uh, and with that purpose, we're going to find comes his power. So we're looking today at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul is writing the book of First Corinthians to a church in Corinth. This is a church with a lot of problems. And the book is really Paul trying to solve problems. And, the, and there are a variety of different problems happening in this church. And around, revolving around these problems are different opinions in this church. And the church is all fractured. So there are these factions, these groups inside of the church that are against other groups. And Paul is going to write a letter. And he's going to instruct them in order to solve these problems once and for all by his apostolic authority for the purpose of uniting the church back together. That's his goal in this book. One of the ideas that's, that's dividing them is this idea of spiritual gifts. And apparently, as we look at this, the main problem is that some people have the gift of tongues, which is a spiritual gift that permits speaking in an unknown language, and some people are over-accentuating this gift and actually arguing that they have uh, more of a spiritual experience in their Christian lives because they have this gift, and it's causing problems and, and, and factions in the church. So Paul's going to instruct them on spiritual gifts, but not comprehensively because his goal is to solve this particular problem. So he's going to teach about spiritual gifts with this problem in mind and explain uh, what the gifts mean in the context of why we have them in the first place, which is to bring us together, not divide us. So Paul isn't just giving a general instruction about spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. He's addressing a problem. We need to know that. What that means is that not all our questions are necessarily going to be answered about spiritual gifts as we look at this passage. But we can cautiously infer certain things from his instruction to these people. Even though our church is not like this church, we have a healthy church here without all this division. But And yet there's things that we can learn from the passage, even though we're not experiencing these same problems. 
We're not divided like they are, but our world is divided. We live in a world that's like that. People out for their own interests. People who are focused on themselves. We don't live in a culture of love, of people who are connected. We live in a culture of division. We're bound together sometimes, and even in our culture, in associations, but a lot of times for things like mutual profit. So we have work families and things like that that connect us to each other and to other people. But even there, the reason we're part of these kinds of associations is because we're profiting in some way personally and individually. We're not bound together in love like we are in the church. See, here we're family. Okay, that's the image. We're family. We're the family of God. Maybe that's not a great... If you don't have a great family, some of us are in fractured families. If you're in that kind of a family, maybe that image doesn't speak to you. But the, the, this is the family you always wanted. These are the most loving people ever sitting out here today. If you don't know each other, they're the most loving people, the family you wish you had in your real family. But this is family, the family, the people of God. Out in the world, people are more fractured than ever. It's getting worse and worse. You go on Twitter on any given day and the attacks and the hatred, the, the bitterness, it's, it's palpable. That's typical of the kingdom that we live in down here, the kingdom that we're passing through. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit. We're in a series on the Holy Spirit. It's, we call the Holy Spirit the helper. He's the parakletos in Greek. He was sent by Jesus to uh, guide us in this life as we walk through this life, as we journey through this kingdom on the way to the kingdom of our great God. The Spirit of God leads us through this life. He's the seal of salvation. Salvation. As we follow his lead, we become different. We become new inside of ourselves. We actually become, if we, if we follow him, the people that he wants us to be and have the lives we're supposed to have. Different character, different heart, and different values that go with that. And they're the values of God's kingdom. But we can have them today. But on our way to that destiny, that kingdom that God has for us, we've got to pass through this kingdom. And we're here because we have work to do. That's why we're still here. We have something to do. We have a purpose in this life, in this dark world. And that purpose comes from the same one who develops the fruit in us. The Spirit of God gives us that purpose. It's His purpose. And as we follow Him, His purpose becomes our purpose. He enables us to achieve that purpose in our lives uh, by means of his power and the outworking of his power for his purpose is known as a spiritual gift. That's what he's given you. So maybe you've asked yourself at different points in your life, why am I here? Why am I here on earth? What am I supposed to be doing? Well, you're here to do the one, the work of the one who loves you and died for you. That's what you're supposed to do. And he equipped you for every good work and saved you for that thing. Made you for more than what the world tells you you are. Made you for more than sitting in front of that screen all day, streaming content to yourself, looking at product ads and things like that. You're valuable. You're loved by the creator of the world, and you are equipped. You've been made for a strategic purpose, which is his purpose through your life. And if you don't feel that way, maybe you don't. Sometimes we go through life, we don't feel like that. Maybe you've believed what they've told you you're good for. So as we come to the text, uh, Spirit of God, I pray that you would reveal to our minds our purpose, Jesus, that you would lead us to the life you would have for us, Lord Jesus, that we would reflect on your power and your glory, Lord, and that with our whole hearts, we would yearn to serve you and see that purpose worked out in powerful ways through our lives, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're starting at 1 Corinthians 12. I'm going to skip the first two verses. Basically, Paul's framing the section. He's telling them in these verses I've got a teaching for you. You've been deceived in the past. 
Please pay attention. That's the first two verses. Then he gets to verse three. He's leaning on his authority, trying to make this clear to them. And the first point here, well, here's the verse. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So in other words, point one here in your outline, if you're taking notes, the Spirit's work can be validated. That's Paul's first point, because there's a lot of error, a lot of error happening, and Paul wants them to understand that the work of the Holy Spirit can be validated. So he's instructing them about a way to validate that, we, that something coming from someone, the words that they're saying, you can determine if they're uh, speaking by the power of the Spirit or not. If someone declares Jesus is Lord, that's coming from the Holy Spirit, Paul says. And if someone's saying a crazy thing like Jesus is cursed, And we hear a lot of blasphemous things about Jesus in the world today. That's not the Spirit of God, Paul's telling you. It doesn't matter Jesus is on someone's lips. Sometimes it's a curse when people say it uh, in our culture. And so it's two different things he's talking about, but his point isn't that narrow. He doesn't actually mean these specific words are the criterion. His point is more general. You can tell what is from the Spirit And what is not from the Spirit of God? Because Jesus is glorified when the Spirit is speaking. You can tell. There is error. There is fakery in the world. There are people who claim to stand for the Lord, but you can tell because Jesus is glorified when the Spirit is actually at work. And here's the caution point. 1 John 4, 1. In in this passage, John says, Beloved, You have to test the spirits to see if they are from God because there are many false prophets gone out into the world. Yeah, our world is filled with different stories and different lies. And a lot of people are trying to connect that to the spirit of God. But the spirit of God lifts up uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. One test. Listen to what is spoken. The Spirit speaks in ways that you can figure out. You can tell when it's Him. It's not the specific saying. It's the idea behind these sayings that we can discern this. So Paul's point is simple. Lots of things are happening out there, even in the church, that are not from the Spirit. People can be gifted in ways that are not the Spirit of God. And you'll hear about error. You'll hear about problems. And what should come to your mind, that's not the Spirit. That's not the Lord. That's just people. We're talking today about gifts of the Spirit. We are not talking about natural talents. A lot of people flaunt their talent in today's world. That's not the Holy Spirit. Paul's starting off by letting them know they must validate what is truly of the Spirit. And part of that is undoubtedly why they are so confused in their church. So then he gets on to the second passage in verse 4. I'm going to continue reading. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. So this is the second point. The gifts of the Spirit are diverse, but they come from the same source. This is the thing you can't forget. In, in division, in division, still, if the Spirit is working, all of these things come from the same source. So what Paul's telling us is to the degree that there's conflict in Corinth here in the church generally, that's not the Spirit. When you see Christians fighting against each other, that's not the Spirit of God. The Spirit gives gifts. He is, distinguishes himself and works through different people to bring us together, to bring us in unity, not opposition and arguments. Uh, of all the people we can fight in this world for the cause of Christ, other Christians should not be the people. Yeah, we, we are connected by the Spirit. There's plenty of darkness out there for us to turn our attention to instead of fighting each other. Now, differences in the natural world out there can either connect you to people or they can divide you from people. That's the way of differences. My wife and I, when we were dating, we took a personality test and we scored on this test and we compared our results and we find out in some ways she and I are very much the same 
And in some ways, we are totally the opposite. Fortunately, we are the same in the ways that are good, and we're the opposite in ways which allow us to rely on each other's strengths. There are ways that she's strong and I'm weak, and ways that I'm strong and she's weak, and so the differences can connect us together as we work together in our marriage. Differences, though, can lead to conflict if, we've, if we allow them to. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the things that complement us can also separate us if we allow those two. I need a person, though, you know, who's different from me because I need help and encouragement. I need to be challenged in different ways in my life from someone who's got a different heart and a different spirit than mine and vice versa. And you need to recognize that because we can get obstinate in life instead of looking at our differences with other people and thinking, this is good for me that we don't always agree and see things the same way. So we humble ourselves. We do it in the body of Christ and you do it in marriage, right? In order to be stronger together. And this is just on a side note. This is, it's hard to keep a marriage together in our culture without the Holy Spirit in the marriage. If you're a young person, you're looking for someone that also, whatever the, the differences and complementary aspects, the thing that binds you to that person is the Spirit of God, the same as in the church. In Ecclesiastes 4.12, Solomon says a cord of, uh, of three strands is not easily broken. And there's the two people, and then the third strand here is, is the Spirit of God tying you together, and you can have strength, and it's the same in the church. He made us different, and we can let that be a problem as we come together, or we can let it make us closer as we lift each other up. Uh, and so in Corinth, it was a problem. Uh, or it can be an opportunity to advance his work using our different strengths. If gifts come from the same source, then they have the same purpose, right? The Spirit isn't against the Spirit. The Spirit has a purpose in this world. It's, it's the per God's purpose. It's his work. It's the same thing Jesus set us toward when he left. And he left the Spirit with us so that we could accomplish it. So it doesn't make sense to let ideas, differences between us, gifts, all of these things divide us, or to attack other people in the work that God is doing through them. But out in the world, it's different. Out in the world, conflict's expected. Sometimes in the business world, you need conflict. I mean, you need to kind of come down on your, on your competition, right, in order to sell your product or do whatever. We're used to that. We're used to some individual agendas uh, surfacing out in the marketplace, but we don't bring that in the church. That's not what we, this is family. We don't do that here. This is where we come together to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and to advance his purposes, bound by the third strand. Yeah, that, that's what connects us here. So if you look at your life through that lens, it means you can't find your purpose out there. Yeah, the, you, the Holy Spirit isn't that third strand in all the associations of life. You can't find your purpose out there. You find your purpose here in him. And so if you're coming in here today and you feel like, gosh, I don't think I have a purpose, then you've come to the right place. Because the Spirit of God is talking to you today, and He's calling you to a life of His power and His purpose. And He's gifted you for it. So that's point three in our outline. The gifts of the Spirit are expressions of His supernatural power through the lives of individual believers for the common good. Let me read this section to you next. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. That's literally in the Greek, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still another, the interpretation of tongues. Okay, I'm going to spend some time on this section right here. It's the thing you're waiting for in this passage. You know, it's uh, the exciting part of this section. 
But he starts it in verse 7 with to each one is given. He actually repeats that again down in verse 11, to each one. Uh, and reminds us, everyone has a gift. You have a gift, at least one gift, maybe more than one gift. You have that by the Holy Spirit. Uh, in his writings, Paul indicates he has a couple gifts himself. He also happens to have a thorn in the flesh. So he's got a medical problem. In addition to having these expressions of God's power through his life, he's also got some problems in his life. And we find out, and Paul lets us know, that sometimes those problems accompany God's power as a way to keep us humble and reliant on the Lord. Uh, But it, it doesn't make sense that we should get arrogant about gifts because the gift isn't you. If you understand the gift correctly, it's not you. It's him. It's his power through you. And we'll talk about that more. So before I unpack this list of gifts in in this section, I want to make a few observations about gifts generally. Okay, first one, gifts are not skills. They are not skills in your life. They're something different. You can have a gift and not have a natural ability associated with it. Uh, You can have natural abilities, including abilities and experiences that make you effective, even for the church, and those not be a spiritual gift. So we can get confused about that. Because in our culture, we use the gift sometimes very broadly. Uh, Like, for example, we're in football season right now. Uh, Tom Brady, that guy has a gift. Maybe you see that. You'll see him do some incredible thing. That guy has a gift, you might say. Mozart. Okay, you'll hear music and you'll think, how in the world did that guy do this? You think he has a gift. I saw a TED Talk with this guy who could do complex math equations in his head real time, where you just call out strings of numbers and he'd multiply them and give you the result right there. I'm like watching this. I'm dumbfounded. I'm thinking, what a gift this guy has got. Okay, but great writers, great speakers, teachers. The reason we call these things gifts in our culture, why we say that Tom Brady has a gift, is because of this passage. What's happened is this passage has leaked into our popular vocabulary over many centuries. And so when we see people that have these extraordinary abilities, we call them gifts because of the language of 1 Corinthians 12. But then we take those ideas and we bring them back to the text as if that explains the text. Uh, And there we can go a little bit wrong. Um, Being a legendary football player isn't a spiritual gift. It might be a gift, and even a gift from God in some sense, and I I hope he'd recognize that all the great things that he has going in his life, Tom Brady, are from God. But it's not a spiritual gift in the way that we're understanding in 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, Spiritual gifts always have as their goal, the common good, which is the work of God in this world. We help each other and work together so that God's purposes on earth are accomplished. When I was 22, my mom told me, I, she had started an evening Bible study. She taught a women's Bible study in the mornings on Wednesday mornings. It was community Bible study. They were meeting at a church in Orange, and she had a huge, 800 women coming to her Wednesday morning study. And, and some of the women wanted to bring their husbands to the study, and they opened an evening study so that the women could come back a second time, but they'd bring their husbands with them so that they could participate because they were so blessed. So the, there were about 80 adults coming to this evening study, and my mom was, had launched that the first year of it. And I got roped me into being a group leader for this study. And then she says to me, I'm 22. She says, God's given you a gift. You need to preach a message. And I said, "Uh, no, mom. I said, he didn't because I'm scared to death of public speaking. I said, I I, I mean, I have avoided, up to that point in my life, I'd avoided every oral presentation in school that there was. And every time I got forced into doing one, it was a mess. I was stuttering, shaking, disorganized. I, I hate being the center of attention. I actually still do hate being the center of attention. I love just standing in the back. And I'm like, there's no way that that's my gift. She's like, Trust me. She goes, the Lord has gifted you. I want you to try this. So I said, okay, for the Lord, I'll try it. I was scared out of my mind. I, I get up to give this talk. I'm so nervous, I mispronounced the Holy Spirit. I say, the Holy Spirit. 
And one of my oldest friends who came to hear me speak, because it's the first time I've ever spoken, sitting there, starts laughing out loud during the talk and wouldn't let me forget it for the next year and a half. The Holy Spirit, I kept hearing about this, it was funny. So I was so nervous. But then I got down after the talk and a few of these people from the study came up to me, you know, people much older than I was at that time, and they affirmed me. They said, listen, God spoke through your talk. And I said, really? And I thought, okay. And I thought, maybe I gotta give this a little time, okay, if this is right. And so over a few years, I ended up as, through twists and turns, the guy that was supposed to take over the teaching of that in the second year had to back out. I ended up teaching every week for the following two years of this Bible study. And, and over that time, you know, speaking became comfortable for me increasingly. I stopped saying, uh, in between everything. And this, uh, and the Lord wants this, uh. I stopped doing that. I learned how to organize my thoughts better over time. And God was able to do more because I was able to offer better skills. Uh, but there are still people who are better speakers than I am out there. But I'm not up here for that reason, because of speaking. I'm up here because this is where God uses me. That's why I'm here, for that chance that he will speak through me and, and knowing that that's his desire. Gifts are not natural abilities or skills. They can line up. You can have natural abilities that line up, but they're not the same thing. Anyone can learn to teach or speak with practice. So maybe you think, I'm not good at anything. Maybe that's your thought. Maybe that's why you're not actively using your gifts in the service of Jesus Christ. Maybe you think, I'm not good at anything. Listen, I got some good news for you. God loves to work in our weakness. Because then his power shines so brightly through us. He gets all the attention. Through our weakness, his strength is evident. Lots of room for him to reveal himself in that case, through your service and draw attention to himself, if you will step out and give him a chance. Okay, that's the first observation. Gifts are not skills. Second is gifts are supernatural. Interesting list of gifts, this particular list at this point in 1 Corinthians 12, because there are other lists in Paul's writings, and they have a little overlap between them. But in this particular list, he focuses on flashy, supernaturally obvious gifts. Things that are like, wow, that's a miraculous work of power. Don't you want that gift? And he focuses on those gifts. Why is he highlighting these at this point? This is to remind us that all gifts, even the ones that aren't this flashy, are works of the Holy Spirit. They are supernatural and they are powerful. Uh, so the list uh, expresses uh, the inexplicability of the gift. Paul is coining some terms here. Word of knowledge? What is that? Word of wisdom? He, he's expressing terms here that haven't even been used in ancient Greek before. In this, so it, to try to capture this idea of the power of the Spirit of God behind His purposes on earth. All you need to do to understand or picture this, though, is think of Jesus. Think of Jesus and the work of Jesus. Jesus was a man who did amazing things. Right? We talk about the, the power that came through the life of Jesus Christ, the power of healing blind people, people who came back from the dead, stilling the storm, things that happened through them, turning a few loaves and fish into enough to feed thousands and thousands of people. We see these things over and over in, in, the, in the ministry of Jesus Christ. How did he do it? He did it by the Holy Spirit. He did it by the same power God is offering and wants, yearns to use through your life. I want you to take that in and pause. If, if you think of Jesus as something other than a man, that he's some superpower, okay, he's not like you and me, he's not a man like we are. If you start thinking that way, you're going to miss the most amazing blessing God has for your life. Because he wants to work through you. The difference is between us and Jesus is Jesus had the full range of gifts and power of God moving without any resistance through his life as the son of God. You and I don't get that. But together we do. 
as the church because we are the body of Christ. Paul's going to use that image here in 1 Corinthians 12 a little bit later. We are the body of Christ. We're like Jesus in the world today. Not with everything in one person, <clears throat> but together we bring together the work of the Spirit in diversity through each of our lives to touch this world the same way Jesus did. So more on this in a minute, but when you think about gifts, think about what Distinguish Jesus and his life from everything else in his world. The power of God, the power of God, and the life that he brought. In contrast to the life people settle for in his time and now in our time, the life we settle for. And if you can picture the difference, you have a glimpse of the life that God wants for you and the power that he wants to use and make manifest through your life and in your service. Third observation, uh, gifts do not all necessarily work the same way or are expressed in the same way. He's picked a really interesting and diverse set of gifts in this passage. You think like teaching, teaching's not one of the gifts listed in this passage. Teaching's one of those more, you know, everyday gifts. He actually mentions it at the, in a list here further down in 1 Corinthians 12. Teaching's something that happens all the time. It happens all the time. I mean, technically, you could come over to my house and I could talk to you about the Bible. I could teach you something almost any day. And I would hope that God would work through that as I did that, as I explained uh, about that. As I prepare and get ready, I would have something to share and it would be, there'd be a word from the Lord in that. Um, and I'd expect that. But if someone has a gift of healing, doesn't necessarily mean it works the same way as the gift of teaching. There's no, no uh, res uh, reasonable inference from this that they all work the same way. That when you pray for people for healing, that God heals on the same schedule that God teaches, works through someone's gift of teaching. We know in, in Matthew 13, 58, Jesus' ab ability to do miracles, it says Jesus couldn't do many miracles in Matthew 13, 58 with this group of people he met with because they didn't have belief. So there's a context within which gifts work and the Holy Spirit's work can be blocked. That's what we come to learn. So we can't expect, Jesus did heal a lot, but he actually spent more time teaching than healing. And in some places it said he couldn't do miracles. Uh, and we see sporadic use of gifts and healing and miracles throughout the book of Acts. If that's a benchmark for us, we see Paul doing incredibly miraculous things in his ministry in Ephesus. Why was he, God doing so many incredible things in Ephesus? Paul's fe uh, facing the uh, the. the demonization and there's a ton of demonic power in Ephesus and God works specifically through Paul's ministry in miraculous ways there. But in other places, Paul's ministry is primarily a ministry of teaching. And so we see that diversity in the way the gifts show up. And this takes us to verse 11. Let me read this in chapter 12. All these are the work of one and the same spirit and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So the Spirit of God determines when and how gifts are manifest for His purposes. Uh, they are His work through us. They work differently. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean people with the gift of healing always heal people. Doesn't We can't infer that. You use gifts, you apply them, you have to be obedient, but He works things out in His timing and for His goals. His goals in different places and different times might vary. Today, we hear stories from the mission field about God's amazing miracles and healing that are happening all the time out in the mission field, and we don't see God work the same way at all places and all times here, like for example, in our country. Okay, but God has his purposes for doing that. And we can trust that he works in the ways that he needs to. And this leads us to the last observation I'm going to make on this section is gifts are revealed as we serve God's purposes. That's how gifts show up. As you serve him, he works powerfully. And you think that's the gift. So you can take a test. I can give you a test. It'll test your interests. It'll test your skills. 
But interest and skills don't necessarily mean you have a gift. They might. They might be a, a pointer, at least get you thinking about it, but it doesn't necessarily mean you had a gift. At one point, I had neither interest nor skill in teaching, I can tell you. Uh, Paul doesn't tell us uh, how to find out what our gift is because he doesn't need to in this section. All you have to worry about is serving the Lord and you will know. That's what we're reading. Serve God. He, it's his work, will come through your life. More about that in a second. I'll, I'll come back to this. So here we have this partial list of gifts. And these are really kind of the exciting gifts in this passage. And he doesn't explain what these things are. Why not? Why doesn't Paul give us a little quick definition of each of these gifts? Well, he doesn't need to. He's writing to people in a church that have all these gifts. He's talking about things that they are seeing all the time in their congregation. Whether they call them the exact things that he's saying here or not doesn't even matter. They know what he's talking about. So he doesn't have to explain it. But we want to know because we don't know if we're seeing all these same things in our church. Or maybe we're thinking, I want that one. You know, pastor, could I get that? The word of wisdom. Oh, I need that. And the people around me, we need that. And so we ask these questions. Uh, I think all the gifts are available today, people. I don't think there's any gift that isn't available today by the power of God. His purposes in different places and different times might uh, cause him to not make certain ones manifest the way that we might want or whatever else. But I think all the gifts are, are still available. Whether anybody has them is up to him uh, today for his purposes. But I know you want to know what, what these things are. So I'm going to say a couple of things because we can infer from the ministry of Jesus and the apostles about some of these things. So let me take another look back on 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. To one there is given uh, through the Spirit, um, a message of wisdom. It's literally word of wisdom. The word word in the Greek uh, sometimes means a communication. That's why they do it this way. A message of wisdom to another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. So word of wisdom, word of knowledge. Wisdom is divine direction. It's God working through you to give somebody a device that is from him. It's not from you. It's not your good idea. It's actually God speaking wisdom through you to someone else. God gives you that word. Knowledge is a revelation of something not known, and God wants somebody to know, and he's giving you a word so that you can give it to someone else, typically, of something that's hidden but needs to be revealed. We see these things in the ministry of Jesus Christ all the time. Jesus knows Zacchaeus is in the sycamore tree. There's this tree. You can't see into this tree. He knows Zacchaeus is in the tree. He's, I'm going to your house, Zacchaeus. I know you're in there. And then we'll have Jesus and the woman at the well. This woman walks up to him. He's never met her before in his life. And he knows she's had five marriages this poor lady, and is on a sixth relationship with someone she's not even married to, and Jesus knows all of it, and he's got salvation for this lady. By the word of God, he knows these things, and she says, she goes rushing back to, to the village in, in Samaria, and she says, this man knows everything about my life. Praise God, and these people flock to Jesus, and, and they all end up uh, uh, coming to salvation. In John chapter 4, we see that. Jesus spoke the wisdom of God to people like Peter, Peter in his foolishness, Jesus spoke the wisdom of God to him. Jesus told him about where he was going, how he was going to die. He indicates, he, he lets Peter indirectly, he lets Peter know about his failure and his, his restoration. Jesus spoke wisdom about these things. So wisdom to Peter confirming that he had correctly identified him as, as the son of the living God. These, these are all part of Jesus' ministry. Uh, then we have the gift of faith. Faith in this as a spiritual gift is something beyond belief. It's when someone trusts God and God comes through and you're like, you're crazy for believing that. Have you ever seen somebody that has this thing? God is, and they, they can't be rocked. I've met, I met a lady in the hospital that had this gift and I came out of it like impacted. She's in the face of her death. Her faith in God, I walked out of that room changed by seeing the joy and, and peace in this lady and her praising God. And people that have this gift, and sometimes it's, get, it's belief in things that are incredible, it is transforming if you see anybody that has this gift. You're, I walk out of there, I'm like, Lord, give me any measure of faith like that lady has. 
praise God for this. And if you've seen experiences, it's clearly from God when you see it. Healing. And he, notice he says here, we know what healing is. We've had healing in this church. We're going to next week start praying during the closing worship service. We're going to have people come forward during, as we're worshiping at the end of service, and we're going to pray for people. We did this back in 2015, if you were here with us. We had some people who got miraculously healed. Uh, and again, not everybody came forward, but we had some people that some amazing things happened because we brought them before the Lord. Notice he mentions here gifts of healing. Paul actually says gifts of healing. Uh, what is that? Every time we pray and somebody and something happens, that's a gift. That's a, that's a gift through our faith to this person. And God gives these gifts and we're going to be praying for people again in here. Uh, uh, mir- miraculous powers. He talks about that. That's actually uh, miraculous powers is actually technically in the Greek. It says uh, works of power. And what is that? There's a lot of confusion about miracles in the world today. Uh, but God is doing incredible works of power through the church. He can't be stopped. The, uh, God, the things that we see in the happening in the world today, people are amazing. But and they touch every part of our lives. And God is doing them today to bring glory to Himself. Same kinds of things. Prophecy. We're going to talk about the gift of prophecy next week. Frank's going to talk about prophecy and tongues in more detail. I'm not going to talk much about them uh, today. Prophecy, though, isn't future telling as much as it is about speaking the heart and word of God to specific to people generally and specifically in the congregation. So when the spirit of God is speaking to you and that message about what he expects of you in your life today, that can be a prophetic word. And it happens all the time. And it's a it's a a much needed gift in the church today. Uh, Distinguishing of spirits is a gift. It's a gift of intuition where because the spirit of God works in the context of a lot of error and evil in our culture, people with this gift can discern it. They know what is the Spirit of God, and they know what is not the Spirit of God in this world. And they can bring that insight to the body of Christ, sometimes false prophecy. They can distinguish this when it happens. And then finally, tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Words of unknown languages, uh, and then the ability to understand and interpret them. We're going to talk about it next time. One time I walked down here through the sanctuary, and we had, we had a, 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 a morning service where we had people kind of huddling up and, and praying for each other in the service. And I remember walking down, and I'm like, I, wait, I hear somebody speaking in tongues. And I walked over, and it turned out to be Mandarin. I didn't know at the time. But it was like the tongue of angels to me, but it was just Mandarin. Yeah. But we're going we're gonna to talk more about this uh, and, and just the, the value of, of tongues. And Frank will say something about it as, as a personal prayer language today, uh, kept in its you know, proper context in our worship service. Uh, we'll talk about that. There are other lists of gifts. And this is, these are the ones where you're like, Lord, I want one of those. Right? These are the lips. Yeah, Lord, I want the word of knowledge, Lord. I want that gift. Okay, and we'll talk about it. You, you can pray for that. But there are other gifts that are not so flashy, like the gift of teaching and the gift of service and the gift of mercy, where, where people feel the compassion, the love of Jesus Christ. It's the transforming love of Jesus Christ through your life. And they're like, praise God for you. The Lord loved me through you. I've, I've experienced that. The, the gift of giving. People with the gift of giving know when and how to give in ways that glorifies God, and it's like God gave it to you. Okay? If you have that gift, I mean, my dad had that gift. It's amazing what I saw this guy do in the lives he touched, and my life, because of his generosity, and he, you couldn't stop him. I mean, he was always, anything, I'll give it to you. It was the kind of uh, man he was, and it was transformative. It was the love of Christ. He wasn't that way before he became a Christian. He became that man. It was amazing. These are given out to advance God's purposes the same way we see Jesus doing it. Jesus had all of these. Jesus had compassion, and then he healed people. They, they go to, some of these gifts, they work together. You, you, compassion and healing go together. Compassion and giving. The world has substitutes. We have the solution. You don't see this power in the world. You see division. We have the solution. But it's to reveal the living God to other people and to draw people, men and women, into his kingdom. Because we desi- everyone wants to see the work of God and the life that they're supposed to have. Not power for its own sake. Uh, getting a prophetic word or looking at scripture and getting some deep insight into scripture or 
Uh, seeing God touch someone through your compassion. There's nothing more powerful than that. That's, that's what you want coming from your life. Lord, do that through me. That's our prayer. Should be our prayer. Okay, point four. The gifts of the Spirit connect us within the church and give us a unique and necessary role. I'm not going to read this, this passage, but Paul uses this analogy of the body of Christ in this passage. Here's the idea. We're all the body of Christ, which is a great image of our unity because we do Jesus' work in this world. But then it's the idea we're the individual members. Uh, And Paul asks this question, where would the body be if the head said to the feet, I don't need you? Well, the head needs the feet or the head's not going anywhere, right? So that's silly, but that's the, what happens when we don't work together with each other. And again, what if Tom Brady said to the lineman, I don't need you. Tom Brady is going to win exactly zero football games, right? As great a player as he is. Uh, and that's the body of Christ. Some gifts seem cooler than others and flashier. I get more attention up here as a teacher than the people that actually make this ministry come together, people sitting up doing sound and all of these things. But but all of us together make this ministry happen. Uh, And God brings all of us together. So we we need to sometimes give the people who are behind the scenes more thanks from us. And that's what Paul talks about in this. The members, like my feet, you know, they're covered up. But I need these feet. Otherwise, this head doesn't make it out to, have, to talk to anybody. And there are people who are covered up, but they're actually the, the work, the Spirit of God works through them all the time to accomplish what we do. Uh, and and, and it's, that's an incredible blessing. So what's my gift? I want to end on this. What's my gift? The primary way you discover your gift is by serving God and seeing what comes out of it. You don't need to worry about knowing your gift because the Spirit wants to work through your life and wants to reveal His power. He wants to do that. Uh, In my life, I've done a lot of different things. Uh, Before I came to Woodbridge uh, eight, nine years ago, I was at another church and I... I'm a teacher, but I was there, and I didn't get any opportunities to teach there. It was interesting. I ended up, I'm like, I want to serve the Lord. I ended up signing up on the facilities team. I ended up doing set up and breakdown before and after service for a year. I was doing that, and it was a blessing for, to, for me to do it. But it was a good chance also just to say, Lord, I'm just going to give you this, and let's see what comes from this. I, I taught, I've given um, I, I was two years a chaplain. I walked into many people's rooms and had an experience where the person said, wow, Jesus walked in. And, and when you came in and talked to me and held my hand, Jesus was here present with us. And I'm like, praise God, because I'm just a guy. But the, the Spirit of God, after a while, I'm walking around the quarters of this hospital. Here I am in my 50s, right? And I'm walking around. I, I think I've got all my gifts figured out. Something like that happens. I'm like, Lord, do I have the gift of mercy? I I don't know, but when you start seeing these things happen, then you realize whether you can explain it that way or not, that's why we're here. And the way you find out is by doing things. So praise God, he works in ways we can't explain, irrespective of our strengths and our limitations. And then verse 31, now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. We're told to desire the greater gifts. These are the gifts that touch other people, that transform people, things uh, that make a difference in the body as a whole. And, And by saying desire the greater gifts, he's saying you can ask for them. Say, Lord, work through me. Give me this gift, Lord. I I want to see your power work through my life. Do you want to know what your gift is? A better question, and this is a real question, do you want the experience of God's Spirit working through you and revealing His power in your life? Do you want to have that experience? Like, I don't know what just happened, but that was God. It wasn't me. Then abandon your agenda, child of God, and serve Him. And he will work in your life. It's that simple. As you live for him and his purpose, live out that purpose, his power will be revealed in your life. In a world of aimless distraction and wasted time, frivolous pursuits, the spirit is calling you to come along his journey on the path 
to the kingdom of our God and along the way to achieve his purposes through you by his power. So we want to pray for that. If, you, if you're today thinking, I'd like a couple chances to figure things out, we have a volunteer central link on our website. There is work to be done. There's work to be done at this church. And we'd love to have you become part of what God is doing here at Woodbridge. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you. Uh, Lord, I pray that the, your spirit would be glorified through our lives. Lord Jesus, that you would bring to our minds just that knowledge and certainty that you will work, Lord, if we give you all that we are. So lead us by your spirit, change us, and then use us, Lord, uh, as we discover gifts and we see your incredible power work. Lord, we give you all that we are in your name. Amen.